Shall I start? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, hello everybody, good afternoon. Um, this is Adam Gear. I'm Fiona Traha. We're from Intel. We work in uh, Shannon on the west coast of Ireland and we write um, a device driver for a hardware device, an accelerator device for the Linux kernel. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned as we've done that. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of background on the Quick Assist device itself. That's the hardware device that we write the driver for. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about in-tree versus out-of-tree driver um, and our journey in getting from one to the other. Um, and then some things we did in terms of reviewing uh, how we design stuff, how we analyze, um, implement, and validate. And uh, some threat modeling we did. Um, and then negative testing. Okay, so just maybe a little bit of background first on uh, the whole concept of acceleration. So if you've got a compute intensive workload and it's running on your CPU on the left-hand side here, um, it might be fully utilizing your CPU 100%, no cycles available for anything else. And if you design some special hardware, as we've got in the Quick Assist device to do compression, for example, or cryptography, these things are quite compute intensive, then you can offload the process from the CPU and that frees up the cycles on your CPU. So your CPU then can do other things. So it'll allow you to either complete your workload faster or to have your workload taken less of the cycles of the CPU during the, the time it's running and that makes it available for something else. So that's the point, I guess, is that for acceleration, you've got some compute intensive um, workload and, and by design in the silicon and the firmware, it can be optimized in how that's done. So the Quick Assist device itself that, that we have, the, as I said, it optimizes uh, cryptography and um, data compression. Um, for cryptography, we're talking about two different types. There's symmetric crypto. Um, we usually call that bulk crypto, um, ciphers like AES and, uh, and SHAZ. Um, and so we do yeah, authentication and, and uh, ciphering. And then there's public key, so asymmetric cryptography. Um, there's a bunch of engines in the hardware and they do uh, digital signature. Um, there's elliptic curve. There's uh, some of the basic primitives like um, um, point multiply, point uh, uh, inverse, inverse, point multiply. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name of that one. So it, they're, again, they're compute intensive on the CPU. And then the third area is data compression, um, compression, decompression. And there's some uh, uh, checksums that go with those as well. So, so far we've talked about the, the hardware. Um, this is just showing what software modules we need to do to enable that hardware. Um, the focus today is on the, the green Linux kernel module, which is over here. Uh, yeah. But if we start at the bottom of the diagram, just to give you the bigger picture, we have our device at the bottom, and the device has uh, firmware that we need to download to the device. Then there's a bunch of stuff in the Linux kernel that we use to enable the device, mainly the kernel driver itself. Um, it plugs then into the Linux kernel crypto framework. And through that crypto framework, um, there's symmetric and asymmetric crypto can be accessed by either other processes in the kernel itself or by processes in user space over here to the left that are kind of grayed out. But they can come through, actually, they're maybe not the right ones. There's ones that can come through, yeah, in, in through the AFALGs uh, APIs into the Linux kernel framework and then into the device driver. And the device driver will mediate the descriptors and build the descriptors to send the data off to the hardware <laughs> to do the work. Um, we have a second path. So on the, the, the kernel driver enables SRIV in the device. Uh, or, well, SRIV is, is built into the device, but it enables SRIV. And that enables virtual functions. So the physical function is what the kernel driver deals with itself um, and, and offloads the data to, to that physical function interface. But on the user space side of things, we want to enable virtual functions. And they're smaller or more, um, it, it allows you to scale the device up so that you can have more processes and user space, each having an independent, seeing it as an independent device. So, so that that's enabled up through some, through VFIO um, for security. And then the VFIO enables the CSRs from the device up into user space. And in user space, these, we've got a set of these blue libraries. These are a set of libraries we expose in GitHub um, called Quatlib. And then above Quatlib, there's different applications that can use uh, the APIs that we provide, the Quick Assist APIs, and they can do compression or crypto. Um, and just to complete the picture in this diagram, some of those user space applications that we have, like Quad Engine and Quad Zip, um, they can also offload to a software, uh, a software libraries that run the same type of workload on the chip itself, on the, on the processor. 
in that case, it wouldn't be offloading uh, to the hardware. But it's just an alternative path if you want to run the same workload on your software, uh, on your CPU. OK, so we've talked a little bit about the whole stack. So now just the purpose of this talk is just to talk about the, the kernel driver itself. So this is a, a more detailed picture of the kernel driver. And the kernel driver has a bunch of different work it needs to do um, and, and different uh, components that it interacts with. So when it wants to, uh, th so those areas are um, on the left-hand side here, we've got some SysFS interfaces. This is where we do some basic configuration, allow the user space process or person, human first as well, to read what's, uh, how the device is configured and also to reconfigure the device. We also have an interface to the PCIe framework because it's a PCIe dev device and to handle errors that the PCIe framework would detect, we register some callbacks and those callbacks get called if a PCIe error is discovered. Um, then another job of the kernel driver is to download firmware to the device and so there's some CSRs there in the, the bar um, that it uses to download that firmware. Um, then this path is quite a, an interesting one. It goes all the way from the quickest driver in the kernel to whatever is used in the VF. And that could be something up here in user space using the VF, uh, the virtual function, or it could be a kernel function as well that could use the VFs. At the moment, we don't expose a, um, we, we have some kernel drivers uh, for VFs, but we don't do them for our latest one. But uh, mostly it's user space access that wants to use that VF path. And then we have the data path. So on the data path here, um, the, the data path is, is, in that case, what we have is a lot of data, usually because if you're going to encrypt data or compress it, you often have a large amount of data. So that's not passed by the kernel driver directly to the vi device. What happens is it's put into a place in memory, in DRAM, and then the chip will, de will DMA it in from that uh, point in, in memory. And there's two different types of things that are DMA'd in and out of the device. One is the, the data itself that needs to be worked on. And the second is some descriptors. And the descriptors are built by the driver to tell the chip what it needs to do. So both of those are in DRAM, and both of them are DMA'd into the device. And the way the kernel driver tells the chip that it needs to do work is, is this doorbell, which is effectively just a write to, an, to a CSR. So you write to register, and then the chip will read in the descriptor over DMA, and then we'll read out any associated data, work on it, and put it back out again with the response into DRAM. And so this data path, I guess what's interesting about that um, is, is so it's used in the case of any process that's coming through LKCF and wanting to encrypt or decrypt data. Um, the Quixis driver itself will build the descriptors and, and send them down to the hardware. In the case of user space, um, this, this isn't the highest performing path. So there's a, if you've got a user space process and it wants to do this kind of encryption um, and it hands over to the kernel driver and the kernel driver has to pass the data on, you've got a change of context. So in the user space processes, we have a separate path which is exposed via VFI OPCI um, and that's a, that provides a direct path to the hardware. So the VFI OPCI enables the CSRs that are in the kernel driver here, uh, sorry, in the device itself in VF to be visible in user space. And, and once they're visible, then the process in, current, in uh, user space can actually directly access it on the data path. So there's, no, there's nothing in between to mediate the, the data or to, to build the descriptors. It's the user, space self, the user space process itself that builds the descriptors. We'll come back to that later because it's an important point. So just the name of the path we have. Uh, so that's, that's, sorry, that's, that's the data path. And I've covered the other paths, PFEF comms, and the other paths we've had here. OK, so we've talked so far about the hardware, the stack itself, and then what the kernel driver needs to do. So just a bit of background on the driver itself. So we've always had kernel drivers, and this family of devices has been here for about 10 years, um, maybe 11 or 12, actually, since the first one, since generation one. Um, but around 2014, we put the first driver into the Linux kernel. And at that point, we had what we call our out-of-tree package. And that out-of-tree package is something which has firmware, kernel driver, user space driver, sample code, and installation scripts all wrapped up in one package, and you have to go to an Intel website to download it. That's great for a lot of our customers. That's what they wanted in the past, and it was much more targeting comms customers, um, ne building networking devices, often appliances, who have full control of their system. But we recognized the value of entry of being in the Linux kernel, and so we also started to move into the entry um, into the kernel in around 2014, and then with the second generation devices, 2015. 
and we based that off our out of tree driver and we re, you know changed we had to change coding standards because they're obviously different in the Linux kernel than we would have necessarily had um, and there was some other things we changed like configuration but basically it was kind of similar to our out of tree driver then in 2020 we have the next generation device which is going to be released later this year it's not released yet but we are getting ahead of it with the software and getting the, the software into the Linux kernel um, and that driver or that device is targeting a broader market so it's a more cloud ready device it's targeting uh, so the, the the previous devices were targeting a trusted environment so we expected that whichever process built the descriptors be that in the kernel driver or a user space process that those would need to be trusted they would they would need to send non not send malicious data to the to the device because the d device wasn't designed to handle that use case but when we, you know, from about 2020 onwards and in our next generation, we're targeting a cloud-ready device. And that cloud-ready device means that you can't trust what's the process running in the VF because it could be anyone. You, you know, you don't know who's going to get your, your device in the cloud. So the silicon and the firmware were redesigned to, co to cope with untrusted applications. And so we then had to take a, take a step back and look at our entry driver and say, OK, is that also suitable for this cloud-ready uh, marketplace? Um, and so we kind of re-reviewed how we did things. We didn't change everything we did, but we certainly made some changes. And, and we just, with that hat on of thinking, okay, this is now potentially untrusted processes in user space that are accessing the device. What do we need to change in the driver? So I think I've probably covered all that here. Um, yeah, I mentioned, so in, in kernel spaces, the AFALG users or the, the kernel driver mediates the, to the device, so it actually builds the descriptors, whereas in user space, it's the user space process that we now can't necessarily trust that's building them. So we, we looked at our, our whole stack design, really, not just the kernel driver, but from usability, extensibility, robustness, and then security. OK, so some of those things, you might think, well, they're still valid for an out tree driver. So you know, our, our, the customers have the same end requirement. They want it to be secure and robust. So what, why, why is it subtly different? That's, that's kind of the question. That it took us a few years I think, to come around to this to realize that. But I think the subtle difference is because when we have an outer tree package and an outer tree driver, um, kernel driver, we, we have a relationship with the customers. So our customers talk to us. They typically have a, a, a PA or a field uh, the, a platform engineer or a field engineer that talks to them. They read our documentation. And actually, we've even designed the driver for them often. So they would have told us their use cases, we'll have built for those use cases, and we'll also validate those use cases. And in that, we may have missed other cases. Um, we also have, in some cases, um, had to make trade-offs. So for example, if you take the outer tree driver, it uses UIO to expose the device up to user space. Um, UIO is inter inherently um, not as secure as VFIO. Um, but if it gives more scalability, so it allows us to break the device into actually smaller, uh, smaller granularity than just VFs. They can actually break a VF into multiple channels and access the hardware um, directly with multiple channels. You could have multiple processes using the same VF. So, you know, when you can have that conversation with your customer um, and they're aware of how to use the device, and you've done all your testing around their use cases, you know, that that's one model. Once we were in tree, we kind of realized after a while, well, you know, we really don't know all our customers. We know some of them, and obviously we talk to the big ones, but anyone could download the device. Anyone could download the driver, and they could run it. And they may end up running it in, for example, an untrusted environment, even though they're not supposed to, and even though they didn't read the documentation, but then, you know, who reads documentation? So we needed to kind of think, okay, how do we make the driver so that they can't even accidentally use it wrongly? You know, make things programmable, programmably clear that they can't actually accidentally use something in a, in a way it wasn't designed to be used. So they were some of the, you know, the things that we kind of thought about. And with that hat on, then we went and did some reviews. Um, actually, let me go back to that one. Yeah, so just to point out, as I've already said, a lot of these things that I'm going to mention aren't things that only apply to our entry driver. They're things that we do anyway with our entry driver, but we kind of thought about them again with a different hat on. So uh, just keep that in mind as we go through the next few slides. OK, so in terms of design, I guess there's three different areas we looked at. First of all, we looked at some design areas, some implementation details, and some validation. So in terms of design, um, we did some threat modeling, just to identify where the vulnerabilities might be or if there are vulnerabilities. We simplified configuration. Again, 
we know that our users of the device now once we're in tree might not know, you know, might not want to either read complicated things or also to understand really how the device works. So for our outer tree, we have these configuration files which have a bunch of parameters in them. You need to understand how to use them and you can change them um, to make the device, uh, to, to break up the device in different ways, have different services like data compression on one VF and uh, symmetric crypt on different VF. So we knew that customers don't necessarily want that level of, of complexity, so we got rid of the config files and we used sysfs. So instead of, uh, so we expose a file in sysfs that explains, that exposes to the user how is the device configured. And we allowed some very simplified, actually at the moment we don't have, we're, we're going to push patches soon, to allow us to do some very simple configuration there, but we're keeping that to an absolute minimum and spend a lot of time trying to think what's the most simplified interface we can expose to customers that they can easily use. And again, in that configuration, it said we're using sysfs rather than ioctals. So we have ioctals where you can do some of that stuff in our other, devi in our other driver, in the Oshry driver. Um, but ioctals, again, mean that the user space and kernel are more tightly coupled. They're sharing the same header files. Um, you don't necessarily want, you know, an ioctals, it, it, they can break, I guess, so it's hard to debug as well. So we've tried to separate out our kernel and user space components. Because again, and this is just maybe a slightly a thing that took us a while to cop on. Well, we, we have this out of tree package I mentioned that has all the parts together, but that means they've all been tested at the same time. And there's like one version of kernel goes with one version of the user space library. Now, once we started to get into the Linux kernel, we're shipping our kernel driver through patches that we send up and we have no control over the time frame of that release. You know, they get in whenever they get in. We're separately shipping with a completely different release process, a user space library. And those use space libraries have to work with whichever kernel they happen to be loaded on a system with. So we, we try to decouple the user space process from the kernel space process as much as we can and keep that a very clean interface with very clear ABI requirements between them. And in sysfs, for example, there's documentation going with sysfs um, in the Linux kernel in the ABI documentation and that says how stable your ABIs are, uh, how stable your sysfs is. Um, and you can say it's experimental if you want to, but once you say it's stable, then you should keep it stable and not break it forevermore, or for a very long time anyway. Um, so yeah, so we tried to decouple them a little bit. Um, we also moved to this capability query approach. And again, we actually, we are doing this in our outer tree driver as well, but we're more kind of, we, we, this is a journey. We're not even fully there with the in-tree driver. But previously we have code in our user space that's saying, make an assumption. So, you know, I know I'm a gen two device, Therefore, I assume I'll be able to do data compression with the deflate algorithm. Or I know it's a Gen 1 device, so I know it you know, can only do 2K PKE keys instead of 4K or whatever. So we, we wanted to remove that type of code. We want to make it very much based on a query coming from the user space to the kernel driver to say, OK, tell me what the device can do. What does this VF do? Does it support this algorithm or that algorithm? And to do it on a functionality-based query instead of assumptions based on the hardware. Um, and that also allows us to deprecate algorithms because things like, you know, SHA-1, um, you know, are becoming less, less well, uh, an, an MD5, say, are becoming less secure, you know, as they get broken. We don't want them exposed anymore, but our library is out there and it might say, well, I found a, I found a device and I assume that that device can do SHA-1, so I'm just going to try to get it to do that. So we, we have no mechanism for deprecating devices when we don't do a capability query approach or sorry, for deprecating algorithms. Um, okay, and the last thing here is, is to make this trust environment requirement more explicit. So I mentioned already that the previous devices, uh, Gen 1 and Gen 2, these are um, built for a trusted environment. So what we did was we added in the VFIO PCI, so not in the kernel driver itself, not in the entry kernel, uh, sorry, not in the quick assist driver, but we added in the VFIO PCI driver a new feature, which was the den deny list. And that deny list allows you to specify a set of hardware modules, of, of PCI modules, that uh, shouldn't be exposed if they're found by default. And, and we put our, our devices into that list. So the PCI device IDs for the Gen 1 and Gen 2 devices are in that list. And so by default in the Linux kernel, you won't get access to those devices. And so, so a customer can't accidentally now find those devices and just you know, offload crypto to them. They don't register automatically with LKC yet. But somebody can use them if they want to, but they have to kind of progra programmatically go in. They'll have had to read the documentation to realize that that's possible, and then they can remove the deny list and, and take the, or, or take our devices out of it. Um, 
And our Gen 4 devices, so our next generation devices, they don't need to be in that list because they are okay in a trusted environment. Sorry, in a non-trusted environment. Okay, I think I've probably covered everything there. Okay, so that was the design areas that we looked at. Um, then we also looked at implementation, so you know, our actual code, what, what can we do differently there. Um, code reviews, we were doing all over the place anyway for all of our modules and all of our components. But in this case, we, we first review within the team. But you know, we're a relatively small team, we're growing, um, we don't have a whole lot of expertise. We have you know, some, some great expertise in the group in the Linux kernel, but we have lots of new people joining the team. Um, so one way to get the experience is that we have a code review team, a, a PDL in Intel of people who write other kernel drivers um, and have expertise in the kernel you know, going back for years. So before we send our patches out to the mailing list, we send them to this internal mailing list and we get feedback there from, to help us. Um, and then once we've done that, obviously we'll send them to the external mailing list. Um, our goal generally is that when we send them to the external mailing list, we don't actually want feedback. <laughs> we just want to know, accept it, <laughs> that's it. We don't want to be the maintainer to have to be you know, telling us to change things, do things differently. So generally that's our goal, I guess, is to get all the expertise ourselves into the team and with the rest of the Intel organization, wider organization, and to, to get things accepted pretty easy, to be kind of some in good quality code. And the other area we do code reviews are secure code reviews. So we have like a checklist of things that we check for secure code reviews to make sure that there's nothing there um, that can expose any vulnerabilities. Um, and that's part of the, the SDL review. So we have an SDL process within Intel, which is secure development lifecycle. And that, uh, th that has a whole series of, of, of checks. And we run through that maybe every quarter or thereabouts for our, uh, our entry code. Um, and it, it has a list of things that we have to you know, double check. Are we making sure that we're not depending on third parties, that we don't, that we're, if we are, have we checked their security status? Do they have CVs open? Um, there's a whole, whole bunch of other things. Do we validate all the input? Uh, do we code review that we validate the, you know, in the code reviews have we checked it? And do we also actually test for that? Um, so there's a bunch of things we go through and we do that periodically, walk through it as a team to make sure that we're covering uh, security. Um, yeah, also in the Linux kernel, there are a bunch of managed uh, device um, resource APIs. So probably you're aware of these, they, we used to have, let's say, dev underscore, now with this dev M, um, PCIM and DMAM, and they're all managed resources. And the main advantage of those is that it cleans up on a failure path. So as soon as you, if you fail for any reason, it's gonna clean up the memory that you've used. Um, so we've changed to use those as much as possible. Um, there's also some functions we're aware of, and again, this comes from our code of your, our secure code checklist, but uh, the one example is string copy. Um, we don't want buffer overruns, so we use SGRL copy, or maybe SGRN copy sometimes, but mostly SGRL copy. Um, we make sure we've got parameter checks on the input paths, and we refactor the code. This last one is maybe, it doesn't sound maybe a lot to do with robustness, but at the end of the day, when you've got a bunch of devices, and in our case, we say with our Gen 2, there's three different devices in our Gen 2 um, stage of the devices, a uh, phase of these devices. Um, and so we found we were duplicating code. We had code per device in, our, in the repo. Uh, so we looked at what's common, and we took the stuff that was common and tried to put it together, so we created a, a generation structure. So there's some code that's common to every device in the generation. We put that together. Um, you know, that helps to make the code more maintainable. I suppose we're constantly trying to make it as maintainable as possible. Because if you've got code duplication, then you end up fixing a bug in one path, you don't fix it in another one, they diverge from each other a little bit. It's, it's generally not as, as robust. Okay, and the validation review then, we had already done a threat model, so we used the threat model to identify some possible attack vectors um, and to locate how do we, what should we focus our validation efforts on. And we made sure we had some robust error handling on the, for invalid input. Um, Adam's gonna talk a little bit about this in a minute. Um, also some error simulations that we did. There's some tools out there we used for that. And then we run static analysis tools on all of our code um, and we build with different compilers. So we build with GCC, we build with CLang. We make sure that we use the warning, minus W equals one on, for both of those to pick up any warnings and address the warnings. Um, we run check patch um, with the minus minus strict option to make sure that we pick up anything there. So we basically try and find out what tools are available and, and use those tools. Um, yeah, and the one last thing we have on this internal mailing list that I mentioned, we have some servers set up in Intel so that as soon as you send 
attached to that mailing list, it automatically goes to uh, Server Farm and does a regression build on it and lets us know if there's any regression issues in, the, in that. OK. So just a little bit about threat modeling. Um, I can't share the threat model with you. That wouldn't be something we would normally do. But just in principle, just the idea of doing a threat model is that we you know, look at what assets are there that need protection. Um, that could be the device itself. And we make a list of what those are, so the device itself. Uh, the, DMA, the, the memory that's used that we DM in, in and out from. The firmware that within the device. Um, so we look at what are all those assets. And then we, you know, we have an Excel spreadsheet where we go down through each one of those and then say, OK, so what's the attack surface for each of those? Is it possible to get at those somehow? Um, and look at where then the trust boundaries are crossed. So, you know, is it, is it on the data path or, or from SysFS? Or is there some place where you've got an untrusted process that has access to these uh, assets that need protection? And then some of those, you know, the answer is actually no, there isn't really, um, and it's impossible to get to them. But we, you know, we look at where they are, and then what's the potential impact if you could get to attack those, those assets, um, and, and how likely is it? And, and what mitigations can we put in place? So that kind of informed then how we, how we validate and, and some other things that we changed. OK, so Adam's going to talk about a couple of things, that areas that we looked at. So these were some of the areas where we, we wanted to focus some efforts. So one was SysFS. So we're exposing some files, and we just want to make sure that nobody could manage to cause a denial of service attack or anything by, by writing bad data in there. Um, another interface we wanted to check was this PCIe when it calls a callback to make sure that we would handle the callback correctly and that the device would recover as expected. Um, and a third area just we want to share is, is how we tested this PFEF comms interface here, which is where the user space is trying to send a capability query, for example, to the kernel driver. OK, so I'm going to hand over to Adam, I think. He's going to talk a little bit about some of those, some of those testing tools that we used. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so I guess Fiona mentioned SysFS already, um, but I can just go into a little bit more detail of what it is. So SysFS is essentially a pseudo file system that can allow kernel subsystems or a, a device driver to expose information, configuration, or functionality to user space. And it does it by using a file. Um, that can be accessed by either a user process or a user. Um, so for this, what we need to do is we, we used a, uh, an open source tool called Redamza. Um, Redamza let us uh, give it an input and it'll give us a fuzzed output. Uh, you can see some examples of that there on the top. Um, some of these you know, there are going to be things that you might not think of, of, of entering into SysFS yourself. Um, and it's a handy way of, of getting generated input um, for that. Um, and because Redamza is a, a CLI, um, what we can do is we can write a bash script to just constantly send attacks over and over and over again until maybe it goes down, maybe it doesn't, um, but hopefully it doesn't. Um, so we're using this tool, what we're able to do is, is validate a range of boundary conditions um, and ensure that our driver, our SysFS interface was robust enough um, to be upstreamed. Um, and as well as that, we learned that we need to tighten up the validation of our input strings um, and as well as that, because we don't exactly know who's going to be accessing our driver, we should probably have pretty usable, um, so pretty, pretty usable inputs. So, for example, we have um, the state of the machine which is exposed, or the state of the device which is exposed, and this can be either up or down, fairly simple. And for configuration of crypto, we have um, symmetric and asymmetric, or both. Um, so. Quite simple, easy to understand for anyone that doesn't read documentation, like me. Um, so, yeah. So moving on to PCI, the PCI interface. Um, so what we're going to be doing here is looking at um, the AER, uh, Advanced Error Reporting, which is supported natively by QuickAssist. Um, so to kind of get at this, what we need to do is have a machine that supports AER natively. And um, we can do this by enabling it in Grub and uh, in the kernel as well itself. We also need to have a, a driver that supports AER as well, and Quick Assist does. Um, we can use an open source tool called AER Inject, and what we can do is we can inject certain errors into PCI um, AER framework, and we can see we can observe how our driver responds to those errors. So there's kind of two uh, categories of, of errors that you can inject: um, one being fatal errors, and one being non-fatal errors. 
Um, for the fatal errors, what you might want to see from your driver is a function level reset and that the driver returns to a usable state and that you can, you can test uh, using functionality tests or integration tests to just make sure that everything returns back to a usability uh, usable space. And for the non-fatal errors, essentially it should just return to normal, uh, kind of the same as the fatal errors, but you mightn't even see any sort of hiccup at all. And um, yeah, the driver should return to a completely normal state. Um, using this tool, what you do is you type uh, AER inject and then you pass in a file and you actually make the file yourself um, and you can pass in the PCI ID of the device and as well as that, the, the error that you want to inject. There's a bunch of these um, and you can kind of pick if it's correctable or, or non-correctable or fatal or um, non-fatal um, and yeah. So what did we learn from this? Well, we learned that we need to reset or change the reset flow of the device and that for one as well, that this tool, AER Inject, was quite easy to use. Uh, I think I set it up in five minutes, and I was able to you know, test if the device was responding correctly to these AER uh, errors. And um, yeah, it's pretty handy for any developer that wants to, to check this. Um, yeah, and I think I'll pass you back to Fiona. Okay, Sorry. thanks, Adam. Bye, Ari. Okay, so yeah, so the last area we want to talk about was um, the PFEFCOMS, that's the physical function to virtual function interface. Um, so I might just jump back to this uh, somewhere here, the diagram. Okay, so this is the interface I said already that I've talked about between the kernel driver and something in user space that's using the virtual function. And uh, I guess one of the first things that we've got this already in our Gen 1 and or in our Gen 2, um, yeah, in Gen 1. Uh, drivers is that we realized early on that if a user space process um, just passed correct data in uh, on this interface, which means it would write into a CSR here that's just a 32-bit CSR, and as soon as it writes to a particular bit in that, it triggers an interrupt over here in the kernel driver. Um, so one of the things a user space uh, device could have done, or driver could have done in the past, is it could have just created lots of perfectly valid request, but had a flood then of interrupts on the kernel driver and caused a denial of service attack by doing that. Um, so we've got some throttling that's in the kernel driver here, so it won't allow that to happen. So it prevents a flood of interrupts being handled um, from any particular VF. And then the other thing we wanted to do was to make sure that, uh, what we wanted to do this time was to make sure that when you write into this CSR, uh, random data, rubbish, whatever, that no matter what you write into it, that the kernel driver is going to behave itself. Um, and, and not get, uh, not have to reboot um, either the platform itself. Sometimes you can actually, in the past, we've been able to pull down the platform with this, but uh, we've made sure that that's not possible anymore. So let me go back a little bit to the ways we thought about doing this. Okay, go back a bit. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, we've already done functional testing, and to do the functional testing of that interface, there's a protocol with kind of timing across that interface. So. We had a, a homegrown test tool that we were using for that. Um, and that test tool focused on passing in correct messages like get the version or get the capability query. Um, the testing we wanted to do was to extend that testing and to focus on corrupt messages, invalid messages, putting rubbish into the different uh, fields in the CSR. And so we had to trade off between using the fuzzing tools or using the, the in-house tool that we had. And, and this in-house tool we had um, as I said, it, it's, it was a quicker ramp for developers. We already knew how to use it. And we found it faster to get there because it, it, the, the other tools like AFL or, or KFL. So AF, KFL is a, um, a kernel version of AFL, which is American Fuzzy Lop, which is a fuzzing tool. Um, and AFL, both of them, what they do is they generate data, something like Radamza does. They can generate a data set, and they can fine tune that data set. And then they can also, they also add code coverage in whatever you're testing as well. So inside in the kernel driver, it can put in code coverage. So when it sends in a particular piece of data, it can then see the path it takes through the code. And it can fine tune that data to, find it, that, to make it go through all the different paths in the code and try and get full coverage. Um, the tool that we used, we, we, had, we had a trade off between you know, which do we ramp on this and, and use it. And because of the complexities of our protocol and because the the data would be injected in user space, whereas it's the kernel space driver reading from a CSR is where we're actually trying to, f trying to break, essentially. Um, they were two different uh, domains. So we found it quicker to get up and running with our own tool. So that's what we did. Um, and, and it was effective. Um, it was effective, but I guess we can see also the limitations of it. So what we've done a lot of fuzzing, 
using that tool, we are also looking at using the actual fuzzing um, off the shelf tools as well, because I think they're quite useful. And so the advantage of them is that they do, um, I said it's a more comprehensive set of data. And, and just to give a kind of an example from uh, looking at what they can do, if, if you, as I mentioned, you, you can get code coverage by using these tools. Um, if you took uh, an example of, say, you're passing in the number 10, and that's a parameter that's going to be passed into the, to the, to the um, process that you're testing. Um, and if that goes through a path which is saying, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an error, it's a greater than whatever value you're supposed to have. Then if you pass in 11, it goes to the same path. And you pass in 12, and it goes to the same path. And you pass 13, it goes to the same path. You're not really learning anything new. So the algorithms in AFL and in the, the tools that are available are actually quite, um, th they're able to tune for that. So they can, you know, they can recognize that you're, you're regenerating the same kind of data, going through the same paths. And so they'll throw away those data sets and, and, and generate other, you know, using the fuzzy logic, generate other data paths. And it can uh, get a condensed set of data eventually that you can use that, that fully checks all your paths to the code. Um, so we use the homegrown tool. The advantage is it got us to results quicker. It's a bit more limited maybe in, in how your, your reporting is done. And it's not, and, and the data set that you've got is quite random in the end. We just randomized all the fields. Um, so the recommendation we would have is to use the fuzzing tools rather than homegrown tools. You know, use one to get there faster with your homegrown tools, but fast track the learning curve by getting help from others in your organization. So we have people in it who have used these fuzzing tools before. So we're getting some support from them to get up and running and rerunning the test using fuzzing tools. OK, so I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, I guess the main points I want to get across is just that you know, code in the Linux kernel, driver code, isn't exactly the same as out tree code. You do tend to have to kind of have a mind shift if you're, if you're in the kernel and your, your audience is the world, then you have to maybe think differently in how you validate, how you design things, how you implement things to make sure that you keep making everything as programmatically secure as possible, that you can't accidentally use something in the wrong way. Um, and that's you know, a good learning from that we've had. And that there's plenty of open source tools available to help you to do any kind of validation you need to do. Okay. Any questions? Ready? We do have some online questions. OK. Um, forgive me if I do not pronounce this correctly <laughs> as well. Is QAT infrastructure ready to be used by kernel file system? Will it be efficient to use QAT for delta encoding, compression, or deduplication by kernel space file system to accelerate file system operations? Um, yes, not deduplication though. Sorry, the other ones were data compression. Uh, so delta encoding, compression, or deduplication by okay. kernel space. Right. Okay. So uh, the first one, I'm not sure about the delta and not the deduplication, but the compression in kernel space, we haven't upstreamed yet. It's going to be upstreamed. Have we sent patches? I don't know if this week, we're not there this week, so in the Im it's imminent. <laughs> okay. We have working versions in-house, um, <laughs> and they will be upstreamed very soon. Okay, okay, and then one more. Is QAT device is ready to be, sorry, is the QAT device ready to be offloaded computation? I mean, access to storage device directly and to execute decompression, for example, not to use CPU resources. So I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but I, I'm so sorry. Let me see. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is so for, it sounds like the same question or just a variant of the last question. Very, so okay. is it available? If they're talking about in kernel, okay. then the entry driver, then uh, as again, it, it, you know, we're going to plug in. So. Compression in the kernel comes through the Linux kernel crypto framework, and so far we've plugged into the crypto parts of that. But compression also com comes under LKCF, and we it's on it's it's a comp is the API, and the algorithm deflate is the one that we're going to expose very soon, um, in the next few weeks hopefully. Um, so yeah, so that 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 is available. Um, it is available already in our user space libraries. So you can access the device if you've got a user space process and use Quatlib, which is on GitHub then that you can access it. But if they're talking about in the kernel, then two LKCF patches are, are, are coming in the next few weeks. OK, wonderful. That's it from the virtual attendees. OK. Oh, OK. We, have one or two we do have time for one question. <laughs> you can raise your hand first. Uh, what sort of uh, static analysis tools uh, you guys use? And what, do you, what are the common things you normally find when you run a static analysis tool on your drivers? OK, so I think this Cochinelle and 
sparse, was it sparse? And I haven't used that one, but I think you did, or one of the other guys in the team did, spatch. Um, and I think there's a third one we use. We've kind of pulled down whatever's there and tried them, um, some of the other people on the team. The common things we find, um, you know, uninitialized pointers, or at least ones that say they can, I mean, to be honest, a lot of times, it's not that they're false negatives, um, or sorry, false positives, but that, you know, you, you can look at the code sometimes and know that actually it probably can never get to that point, but the tool will throw up something saying, yeah, I can get, you know, that there's a, a false positive here. Um, so yeah, they tend to be fairly quick to fix. I mean, and they're, they're generally that kind of level of pointers uninitialized or paths not followed through the code or paths followed through the code with some data not initialized before it was passed into it. Okay, sorry, got to stop now, but happy to take questions afterwards from anyone. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. That went well.